Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to talk about Windows Explorer thumbnails. You know, those little images that are generated as previews when you browse to a folder in icon view. You'll see them for things like pictures, PDFs, and certain other file types. There are actually two flavors of them, and the first I know you've heard of, it's called thumbs.db. It was actually introduced way back in Windows 2000, but it's still around in current versions of Windows to include Windows 11. There is a more modern replacement of that though that was introduced in Windows Vista and it's called thumb cache. Specifically, the files will be thumb cache underscore followed by a resolution like 1280.db. Thumbs.db files in Windows Vista and later are created within the respective folder browsed to via a UNC path. So in other words, something like slash slash computer name slash some path here. Otherwise, the images are centrally stored in Windows Vista and later in one or more of those thumb cache files that I mentioned earlier. Those are located within each user's app data local directory, specifically within Microsoft Windows Explorer. In this episode, we're going to take a look at two utilities by Eric Kutcher that make it possible for us to view the contents of these databases, the aptly named Thumbs Viewer and Thumb Cache Viewer. Now, why would we want to do this? Well, for certain investigation types, especially those involving illicit images, the thumb cache may show evidence of images that have long since been deleted or even securely wiped. But also consider that these icons are generated for other file types as well. Imagine, for example, a PDF containing sensitive information. Maybe it's the Colonel's secret chicken recipe or something like that. Well, if you could see a preview of the first page of that PDF, that may very well be enough to recognize what that document is, right? So you could identify exactly what file might have been present at one point in a specific folder, just based potentially on that alone. That's where the value of this artifact comes into play. And it's a rather obscure artifact that at least recently I haven't seen mentioned very much. So that's why I figured I would make an episode about it just because it's not something we've talked about previously on the channel. Let's take a look at the ARTA facts for thumbs.db and thumb cache. We've covered most of these already, but for the sake of completeness, let's go through each item here because there's a lot to unpack with these relatively simple sounding artifacts. As we said, thumbs.db was introduced back in Windows 2000 to increase Windows Explorer performance by caching thumbnail images of files within a given folder. This means that if you revisited a folder that you had previously viewed in film strip or icon view, it wouldn't have to regenerate those thumbnail images. It would just pull them out of the cache, which of course would be faster and make the overall user experience better. Thumb cache, as we covered, largely replaces thumbs.db in Windows Vista and later, but thumbs.db is still created for those UNC paths. Thumb cache underscore xxx.db, where xxx is a number like 1280, refers to the resolution of the images contained within. So in other words, thumb cache underscore 1280.db means that that file would contain 1280 by 720 resolution thumbnail images. Also, unlike thumbs.db, these thumb cache files are centrally stored within each user's profile under app data, local, Microsoft Windows Explorer. You'll also find, by the way, an IDX file in this location, which serves as an index to map exactly what's stored in each of these files. Thumb cache IDs and hashes, not like SHA-1 or SHA-256 hashes, but a hashing algorithm specific to the thumb cache artifact, are stored within the thumb cache database. And these can be used to map the path of the source images, the original images for which the thumbnails were created in the first place. This is usually done by one of two methods, either scanning files across the same source system and comparing the hashes or by matching the system.thumbnail cache ID value to the Windows search windows.edb database. It turns out that Thumb Cache Viewer supports both of these options, but we'll be using the scanning option during the demo. And lastly, as we just covered, both thumbs.db and thumb cache can be useful for identification of files no longer present on the system. And remember, that's not just for images or pictures, but certain other file types as well, such as documents. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and hop over to our Windows 11 box and take a look at how thumb cache viewer works. 
I'm actually not going to demo Thumbs Viewer because once you know how to use Thumb Cache Viewer, it's the same thing, same kind of interface. And I would argue you're probably more frequently going to use Thumb Cache Viewer anyway. All right, let's get started. Okay, I have Windows Terminal opened on this Windows 11 box, and we're in the root of my user directory under Users Davis RG. Let's go ahead and take a look at the location of the thumb cache, which again is under App Data, Local, Microsoft, Windows, Explorer. If we do a DIR in this location, we should see the thumb cache files, which start right here with thumb cache underscore 1280.db, which happens to be the largest of the thumb cache files here at approximately 50 megs. This is the very file that will likely open with the software for our demo here in just a moment. But it should come as no surprise that the larger the number, the higher the resolution, and the higher the resolution, the more value it's going to be to us because the more detail we will have in the images contained within. So if it's like, for example, the first page of a PDF, obviously it would be beneficial to us to look at the highest resolution preview image so we can tell what that PDF was or what that JPEG or that ping was. So this is actually the file that we'll use for the demo, but you can see other ones here in this location as well. Let's go ahead and minimize this. And now let's open that thumb cache viewer, which is going to be on my system under tools, miscellaneous. And then you can see both thumb cache viewer and thumbs viewer. Of course, we'll use thumb cache viewer. So I'll double click to open, close the Explorer window behind it. And this is thumb cache viewer. As you can see, the interface is very clean and it's actually pretty self-explanatory. Let's go over to file to get started and choose open. And you will notice that it automatically went to the last location I opened, which is the very location we looked at in Windows Terminal, which is App Data Local Microsoft Windows Explorer. By the way, if you know what forensic artifact we would leverage to look up this last location, then let me know, because obviously Thumb Cache Viewer knew that we had opened this specific location, and therefore it pulled it back up when I opened the software again. The question is, how did it know to go there? Well, that information is stored in a forensic artifact that I don't think we've actually covered on the channel, but if you know what that is, leave it in the comments below. All right, let's scroll down and find the file we're interested in, which is right here, thumbcache underscore 1280.db. All I'm going to do is double click to open it. And we have now a bunch of random looking JPEGs and pings listed here with no discernible file names. Don't worry, we'll get to that. but. As we scroll down, you'll notice varying sizes. You can notice uh, several other columns here that, that will be beneficial, but specifically the data size would be something interesting to you. We'll click on the first one and notice that it popped open a window to the right that says 1280 by 720, which is the resolution of this particular image of all the images in this file. And it looks to be OBS because it is OBS. What this is, is a uh, thumbnail that was created for a screen recording that I performed in OBS, like the very screen recording I'm creating right now with OBS. So every time I create one of these files, the actual .mp4 file saved out by OBS has a little icon that is a, the preview of it, and it's this image right here. So that's why there's so many of them on the system. But as I scroll down, well, here, for example, this is a screenshot I took of some dissect web page for the episode covering dissect, which by the way, if you haven't watched it yet, check it out. Very awesome IR framework. And this looks like a screenshot from GitHub. If I continue to scroll down here, we'll see various other things, wallpapers. Uh, there's a Windows Explorer screenshot of some kind, something dealing with a start menu, it looks like there. And if I scroll down a little further, there's more wallpaper, but we should see, yeah, right here it is, some Microsoft Flight Simulator thumbnails. And what this is, is basically a bunch of wallpaper that I created from Flight Sim 2020. I was messing around one day and I opened Snagit and just created a bunch of beautiful screenshots that I could use as background images, wallpaper. And I saved them somewhere under my pictures folder. A lot of them are still here on disk, but I think it was like pictures, backgrounds, and then I named the files. I think it was like MSFS space number, like one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. So that's what a lot of these are, as you can see here. And there's a bunch of other stuff here as well. Now, let me first show you that if I wanted any of these images to be exported, all I have to do is right click and I can choose save selected. 
I can also remove, copy, select all, or choose extended information if that information is available. Here in this case, there's nothing under extended information, but let's go ahead and right click and choose save just to show you what that looks like. It'll pop up a browse dialog. I'll just choose desktop and click save or click OK. And that's all there is to it. On my desktop, you'll have to take my word for it, but this D2 blah, blah, blah dot ping file has now been saved to my desktop. And it's that full 1280 by 720 resolution. So pretty self-explanatory there. But again, let's think about the fact that we don't have any discernible file names here. Now with thumbs.db, that wouldn't be a problem, right? Because in the Windows XP days, you had a thumbs.db created in every directory that was viewed in icon view or film strip view or whatever it was called back in the XP days. It's been too long, I don't remember. But anyway, the point is you knew where a particular thumbs.db file came from because obviously you took it from a particular location and that thumbs.db file contained only the thumbnails for that location. But here, this is a central store, remember, under app data local. So how do we know the original location? Well, one way we might be able to figure this out is to go over to tools and choose map file paths. And the first option here says scan directory. I can choose show details here, but in general, what we're going to do is point to an initial scan directory. So I'll click the ellipsis and just point to the root of C and click OK. And it says limit scan to the following file types. Of course, we can change this, but it's basically JPEGs, pings, BIMPs, and GIFs. That's right, I said GIFs. Anyway, all of this is right here, and all I have to do is click scan. I won't speed this up. This is happening in real time, and in just a second, it should make a little noise and pop up and tell us that the scan is complete. But what it's trying to do is, well, just as the dialog says, map the file paths. So the end result should be that at least some small subset of these pictures, these images, should be able to be mapped back to their original locations. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind though, a lot of these are from directories that are probably no longer existent on the system, things that I've since removed and deleted, so the original location may not be discernible. In this case, as you can see, it completed saying that 22 files were mapped. I'll click OK and close this. And now if we scroll down, we should see that some of these have actual file paths. So if I move this over a little bit, you can see, for example, that these are the original locations of the files under C, users, Davis RG, pictures, backgrounds, and then you've got a name. This one is called Bloom Edges. This is MSFS1432, so on and so forth. And if I scroll down, you'll notice that a few others down through here have the full file path populated as well. Obviously, this is going to vary greatly on the particular system that you're doing this on. So, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Your results will vary, but you get the general idea of why we need to do this. Because again, remember, Thumbcache is now centrally stored. Remember, though, as I said in the intro, that does not mean that we won't have thumbs.db files. They are still around and they're generated when you browse to a UNC path in Windows Vista or later. So again, that would be something like slash slash computer name slash sum slash path slash here. And then you view that in icon view. So at that point, a thumbs.db file, just like the old XP and Windows 2000 days will be created in that location on the UNC path. And obviously you won't need to map the file names in that case, because clearly the location from which the thumbs.db was taken is the location pertaining to where those images were, right? That makes, hopefully that makes sense, right? So at this point, if you wanted to do the exact same thing we're doing here, but with thumbs.db, you would just use the other utility, which is the thumbs viewer instead of the thumb cache viewer. And the interface is largely the same and works the same way. I won't bore you with showing you that because again, once you've seen this, you can use it and you can certainly use the other software as well. All right, so with that said, that wraps up what I wanted to show in this episode. Now, hopefully, if you didn't already, you've got a good understanding of how Thumbcache and Thumbs.db work, and you know exactly what utility you can use to parse them. And of course, I'm sure there are plenty of other utilities out there that can do this, but these have been my go-to for quite a while. All right, so that's it. I hope this episode was useful and informative to you. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next 13 Cubed episode.